I mean, you can pick up a book, and a book can show you the mechanics of kicking, but that's not like learning kicking from Bill Wallace. That's not like studying kicking in situations where you've got the finest practitioners putting it to use and helping you to understand why it's done this way. Hello, everyone. It's time for another episode of Martial Arts Radio, the show that brings you amazing stories from the world's best martial artists. Today, we're talking to Shihan Grant Campbell, and this is episode 124. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the web's best podcast on their traditional martial arts twice a week. Welcome. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the host and founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you checking us out for the first time. If you're new to the show or our great products, have a look at our shirts. Everyone loves a great shirt, right? Which is why we have something for everyone. Check out all of our great t-shirts and sweatshirts and all that good stuff and everything else we make. It's all over at whistlekick.com. If you want the show notes, including photos and links to the things we talk about today with Gian Campbell, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you're not on the newsletter list, what are you waiting for? We send out exclusive content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. As a thank you for joining, we'll send you our exclusive Top 10 Tips for Martial Artists podcast episode. Sign up for the newsletter at any of the Whistlekick websites. I first met Shihan Grant Campbell during the March 2016 Superfoot Black Belt Gathering in Florida. It was during the same assembly that I met Kyoshi Kevin Hudson, and of course, Sensei Terry Dow and Bill Wallace were there. I met a lot of people that weekend. It was a wonderful time, and everyone was very skilled and a great person to work with. There was one person, though, that stood out for me in the way he helped me through that weekend. Because, let's be honest, it was kind of tough. I was with some incredible people. We've all worked with martial arts practitioners that seem to understand us, to know our journey, and really just to make us better. And Shihan Campbell was that person for me, at least on that weekend. I enjoyed his help with the physical aspects of our training, but I also really appreciated his humor and the stories during meals and downtime. I knew that he was someone that we needed to have on the show. And so here we are. The scheduling took some time as he's really busy with training and teaching and traveling, but we made it happen. So listen in and you'll see that it was worth the wait. Sheon Campbell, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thank you. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you for uh, inviting me onto the show. Oh, of course. It's it's an honor to have you here. And we should probably tell the listeners how we met. I mean, I, just about everybody that comes on the show, I've, I've had at least a little bit of personal contact with. And um, so fans of the show will know that I was fortunate enough to go to Florida in March of 2016 and, and train with Bill Wallace and, and meet a number of his black belts. And you are one of those people. <laughs> yeah, had a great time working with you, and and you know you you educated me well. I, I learned a lot, and and really appreciated your time. And you know we got to spend some time that weekend, and you told great stories. And I said, this is a man we need to have on the show. Well, thank you, thank you. Your spirit spoke for itself, and you know there was a natural inclination to help somebody that has the right attitude, the right spirit. You definitely uh, you definitely exhibited that. It was a good good overall experience. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to have you say that. Now, we we tend to start in a pretty generic manner, but really an important manner to give us some context for our guests. How did you get started in the martial arts? Well, my own uh, martial arts training started in uh, 1970. Yeah, I don't want to date myself there. It sounds kind of like a long time ago, but it... um, Nah. It... (laughs) <laughs> nah. It started in 1970. Um, I'm from New York City originally, and I got into martial arts because of bullying and things like that. I, I actually, um, the final straw for my parents was a combination of a couple of situations because I got the whole, you know, don't tell anybody we're bullying you or we'll kill you or yet that kind of thing. I got all of that. But uh, the final straw was when I I had gone out with some friends to an empty lot to do baseball. You know, we were going to play some baseball and that kind of thing. And I had my bat, my glove, um, 
they chose up sides because I was a real skinny kid, real skinny, asthmatic kid. I was the least likely to get picked. So I didn't get picked on any, either team. And, uh, they took my bat, my ball and, uh, you know, the glove and said, we'll give it back to you in a few minutes. And that was hours. And I was waiting there when I asked for the ball and bat back, they hit me with the bat and knocked me unconscious. And, um, that was the, that was the beginning of my, um, my martial arts training. My parents realized I need to, I needed to know more about self-defense and that kind of thing and that kind of environment. And in the aftermath of the, uh, the civil rights movements and a lot of unrest was going on just in general at that time. So they just felt it would be really advantageous for me to be involved in a school. And my father was very familiar with martial arts and that kind of thing. He hesitated to get me involved in training very early because at that time there were children in the martial arts, but it wasn't a common thing. And most of the martial artists got exposed to martial arts as adults. Dojos were not child friendly places, as you can imagine, uh, in comparison to now that took place in the eighties, that whole shift of, uh, people recommending martial arts for children for self-discipline and all that kind of thing. Because back in the sixties and seventies, nobody was doing that. Nobody was talking about children need to study martial arts for these reasons and that reason or whatever. So here you are, you're, you're a child and your parents say, you know, we, we got to get you some self-defense. We got to keep you from getting hit with bats and picked on, <laughs> yeah. um, which you know, we've had a lot of people who've had even one specific incident that they can point to that led to them joining the martial arts, but mm -hmm. most of them are not that violent. Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, that, that's, that's pretty heavy. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that that set the tone or maybe I shouldn't say, sh did that set the tone for your training? Absolutely. Because of the combination of where I'm, I'm from originally and my parents and their, you know, my upbringing, my interests in martial art, my reasons for taking it, my reasons for continuing with it are all, um, little, little different perhaps than, than, than some other folks. I got into martial art because of a need specifically. I mean, this was, this was a life saving endeavor for me as, um, I mean, many people get into martial arts for recreational reasons, something to do. Uh, they don't really find a niche, things like that. I was unable to play any other sports. I wanted to, but I was unable to play any other sports until I came in contact with martial art. And um, then at the same time as I was starting to study, uh, <clears throat> it was a unique time, I think, in in the United States for martial arts because it had made its entry into the United States, but it was just about to hit the boom, uh, the Kung Fu boom, I guess the Kung Fu explosion where, um, people like Bruce Lee and, and, and other martial arts people came to um, the public attention. And at that time there was nothing like that in this country. And it made physical training. It made, learning martial arts, a big, big deal by comparison to today where there's so many distractions. You have hundreds upon hundreds of TV stations and cable things that people can watch and all these, uh, not to mention the internet and, and the unlimited, virtually unlimited possibilities that exist on there. There are so many distractions pulling people in different directions. Um, it's not similar in terms of um, what kids grow up seeing, their, the role models and things like that. They're a little bit different now. Things are a little bit different now. There is no one person that can impact on millions of people in quite the same way as in that period. I mean, just using someone like Bruce Lee as an example, he is singularly responsible for popularizing the martial arts around the world in a way that no one ever did before that 
and has done since that. And that was a significant thing. He made, uh, he appealed to me and the idea of working out and a lifestyle of martial art. I mean, that was, that was a significant thing to me growing up. And we've, it's interesting you bring that up because we've talked about that on the show. And my question, and I'm, I'm curious of your answer, is it even possible for someone to have the kind of impact on the martial arts that Bruce Lee did today? Quite honestly, I don't think so, because I think just as in, I think most of the listeners would tend to agree. Timing is everything. Timing can be the difference between winning a fight and losing it. Timing mm-hmm. can be the, the, the difference between meeting the person of your dreams and settling for something less than that. Um, you know, in this kind of situation, you know, for the benefit of the listeners that are a little bit younger, I'll say this. There was no, there were no handheld electronic devices. There were no computers in the household. There were no videos as we know them, clips, tapes, things like that. So in that time period, television and and things that were playing in the movie theaters, that was the major form of visual entertainment that existed. There was no YouTube. There were no, you know, clicking on these different things, get bored, click on something else, all of that kind of stuff. It didn't, it just didn't happen. There, it didn't exist then. So there are so many options vying for your attention now by comparison to then. I mean, growing up in New York, we had Channel 2, Channel 4, Channel 5, Channel 7, Channel 9, and Channel 11. That was it. And those stations, for the most part, turned off at 11 o'clock, came back on at about 6 o'clock in the morning. So you're talking about a completely different environment than the instant gratification environment that we're in now. So in answer to that, I, I really don't see any one person being as influential. And in that time, the martial arts were in their infancy outside of the Asian areas. So um, in the United States, you just did not see the weaponry. You didn't see the classic fight scenes of one person pitted against 17 people. You know, you didn't see that. Now that's pretty much that's pretty much routine. People grow up seeing martial arts here, just as for you know for many many years in Asia, children grew up and they were familiar from having seen it with martial arts. That was completely different in the United States at that time. The United States kids didn't grow up seeing kicking and punching or any of that before the 70s. That just didn't that just wasn't that way. So I don't I don't think anybody's going to be quite that influential as uh, as a Bruce Lee around the world, anyway. Yeah, I agree. I didn't want to corrupt your answer, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. Yeah. So I know a, a bit about you, you know, just from our conversations and things that I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more as we go on. You've traveled, you've experienced a lot of amazing things, trained with a lot of amazing people, mm-hmm. and that leads to a lot of stories. Oh. And if I was to ask you for your best martial arts story, what would that mm. be? Oh gosh, best martial arts story. It's, like, <laughs> it's hard, you know, there there's um I've never really thought about that. I've never really thought about it, you know, I I just when I'm with with people in the right kind of environment, sometimes it'll trigger a memory or they'll say something that'll remind me of something, but I, I haven't really thought of any one incident as being like the high point um, of the martial arts career that I, that I have, I've, I've been blessed because I've had the opportunity to study and have long-term committed relationships with some of the best martial artists. um, In my opinion, some of the best martial artists um, of the time. And uh, I valued that a great deal. So, um, yeah, I mean, there were 
there were stories where, you know, the, 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 the teacher, um, the teacher that I had in, in Okinawa when I lived there, um, opened doors to me to meet the, um, family members of people like Miyagi Chojin, the founder of goju Ru, um, uh, Funakoshi Gichin, the founder of the shotokan Ryu School, and, uh, and many, many, many other people. Those have to be among the, the high points of my martial arts career. I mean, having the opportunity to train with, on a consistent basis, people that most people only read about, hear about, um, you know, in passing or hear about, you know, in, 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 uh, in terms of being inspired by that's, that's left an indelible mark. And I mean, there's so many different issues, uh, and stories and things like that to come out. I mean, uh, you know, yourself, for example, training with, uh, training with Bill Wallace, training with, um, you know, many of the other people that I've had the good fortune to be with just, uh, I don't, I wouldn't even know where to begin with that particular question. That's a hard one. <laughs> well, if I might corral you a little bit, maybe it'll, it'll help. Sure. You had told me a bit about the time I mean, that you just alluded to living and training in Okinawa mm-hmm. and that you had done some competition over there. Yes. Yes. And that you were one of the few that wasn't local to see some success in those competitions. Yes. Well, yeah, that, uh, you know, breaking down doors like that. And, um, it goes back to your earlier question about what, you know, what martial arts, um, what was my reasoning for getting involved? My, my, my reason was always self-defense and, my specific reason for staying with karate as my primary art has to do with the fact that when I got the opportunity to see real karate being practiced, the use of the hands and feet, it was just, it was just exceptional for self-defense. And I felt very confident that that was something that I could utilize in a self-defense situation and I can't teach or practice something that I don't believe in. And uh, it answered and addressed every question for me. The, um, the interesting thing about being in Japan and competing was that when, when you train here in the States, okay, you, you'll earn a black belt in the school or that school and whatever. And, you know, we think of competition in a different different sort of way over there representing the art that you practice representing the teacher that has taught you it it has a greater meaning and when you're practicing and you're training in a dojo there and you've made that kind of commitment there's certain cultural martial cultural things that are taught that most schools here just don't even graze over they don't even graze over. So the environment there is, is more intense for that aspect. Doesn't mean that they're better in terms of um, being a practitioner. It just means that there's an intensity there and there's an understanding that's interwoven through the practice that's a little bit different here. Um, mm. having, to, having to earn the respect of my fellow competitors because in many cases, People have gone to Japan, they've studied or they've, they've shown up over there, but they haven't really earned respect because of how they've behaved. They haven't really earned respect because at times you'll see people pose for a picture and then represent that uh, it's more than just a picture with someone. They'll represent that they've studied with that person when in fact all they did was visit Okinawa for maybe a weekend or a week or two weeks on a vacation and they tell the story when they come back and and all that. So in many cases, um, foreign practitioners that are very dedicated and serious have to break through that stigma. And the only way to break through it is with your skill. That's the only way, the skill and the dedication by which you, you know, you show your art. So I think that was 
if I have to, if I have to pick one thing, I think that was something that, that really opened my eyes in the, uh, in the martial art world, because in this country, in America, a lot of times you, you'll get guys that, you know, they practice Shotokan style or they practice the Gojiru style or they practice the, you know, the Kempo or whatever. And this guy over here won't recognize them or there's different variations and versions and things like that. You don't see as much of that you, over there. You, you do have different schools and different, um, what they call duha or kaiha, which are different, different versions of the same practice because you have different practitioners that studied under the same teacher and they may have slightly different ways of doing it, but they all trace back to the same source and they all are recognizable. Whereas here, you know, you'll have people that are using the name of a school, but they have no relationship to the school whatsoever. And they have no root that leads back to the same common source. So fundamentally there, there are major differences there. I've seen people mm -hmm. stand up to do uh, kata, for example, and it was just completely unrecognizable. You don't have that as much over there at all. What would you chalk that up to? Why, why would the various flavors that have come up here in a shorter period of time hmm. not have occurred there? I think I think one of the things that uh, contributes to so much of the problem of martial art is that it, it, it is a life changing experience. I think anyone that has done this for any length of time will admit that it becomes a part of you. It creates an energy within people. Um, one of the things that I think has happened is that martial art can create a desire in the right people to want to help others, to want to contribute to their community, things like that. Problem is, it's a long road. And in many cases, the practice methods of martial art are just haphazardly kind of form, meaning um, a lot of people are out there teaching that were never trained on teaching. They've never been taught how to teach. They're kind of winging it. They're kind of just basing it on what they think would work or how it might be and things like that. And in any of the arts, there's a way, there's a protocol. And what happens is a lot of times you'll get a person that studies a martial art. And I'm sure as a teacher, most people that, um, that are teachers can relate to this. We'll all have students. They'll, they'll be with us for a year, two years, five years. And um, just imagine if in any of these students that we've had can just declare themselves to be a teacher and start sharing what they feel or believe or what they've been exposed to with other people and their interpretations. After a year of training, five years of training, most of us that have been doing this for a length of time are almost embarrassed at what we thought martial art was at the end of a year or five years and what we believe it to be now. So a lot of people that are out there or have been out there with a year, two years, five years of training, we're doing their best, but there are a lot of mistakes being made. There are a lot of things that were contributing to misinformation, miseducation. I can't tell you how many people I've taught seminars in that have hip and knee problems because the stance training that they were doing early on was incorrect. It just wasn't proper and it didn't get caught. And now they're repeating the same injuries that some of their teachers have had and developed. See, it's a different experience when you have military people that are obviously adults in order to be in the military in the first place. They're highly disciplined. They're coming over. They're exposed in Asia to a different culture. For recreation, they choose to study martial art. There's a language barrier. There's a frustration level. And it's one adult to another adult. If I can't teach you to keep your hands up, and in my culture it's permitted for me to slap a student, then I'll slap you, say some words, you won't get it, I'll roughly put my hands on you, 
and, and put your elbows in position and try and make my point, even though you don't speak the same language, eventually you get it. The problem is these guys that are in that environment sometimes have come back and they think that's how karate is supposed to be taught. And they will do that to students, even though there is no language barrier. We speak the same language. We don't have the same frustration. There's not a post-war situation here. You see? So these things contribute to why there's so many different approaches and why there's so much misinformation. And, you know, there are a lot of people out there teaching that when you add up all the amount of time that they've actually put on the floor under guidance and being under a, a, a strict eye or a strict code of, of uh, behavior or, or training, it really comes to very little time at all. Hmm. Wow. That, that's interesting. I don't think I'd ever considered the cultural element in the way that first generation of Americans was trained. And it sounds like we could probably go off and have an entire conversation about that. And, and maybe we will mm-hmm. at, an, at another time. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm going to wrap my brain, try to wrap my brain around it. That's fascinating. <laughs> As I said, living, living there changed the perception. It changed the reality of martial art training for me. And, you know, my entire adult life, I, I've, I've been a, a practicing martial artist. So putting this to use and making it a lifestyle is something I've always, I've always done. And mm. uh, searching for the correct ways of practice and, and the correct methods and things like that um, just brings the right things into your life. It really does. Yeah. Now, obviously, martial arts is a huge part of your life, maybe the biggest part of your life. Mm-hmm. But when you're not training, what else do you like to do? Do you have any any hobbies or anything? Well, I you know, I love spending time with family. I love um, reading and just pursuing different goals, helping other people to pursue different goals. No, I don't, I don't have hobbies like bowling and things like that. I think all of that is kind of wrapped into my martial art practice. And, and, but to be well-rounded, I mean, I do a variety of different other things, obviously as well. I, I, uh, I oversee some investments and things like that. And I have other interests other than, um, you know, the, the martial arts, but right now, um, I spend a great deal of time studying. I'm in a, uh, I'm in a, a course of study for, uh, naturopathic, uh, health. So I, I enjoy that quite a bit. I've completed studies in acupuncture and oriental medicine. I've gone to China for that as well. And, and, um, you know, yeah, I kind of have a, a multitude of other interests that I, that I involve myself in. So I'm not a person that ever is bored. Or, you know. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have expected so. <laughs> yeah. We've had a number of people on the show who are, you know, advanced martial artists, but are also acupuncturists or healers, you know, mm-hmm. just under, under a broader term. I see. Do you draw a correlation between your martial arts training and those pursuits? I think, I think, um, because there's so many diverse personalities in martial art, I think, and I have to qualify this as saying certain types of people will um, be inclined to explore the deeper meanings of some of the things. So for example, in an effort to really understand the martial arts, you have to understand the culture from which they come and to varying degrees, different types of people will engage in a deeper study along the line of the oriental medical practices and things like that. In my case, my teacher recommended it to me in order to understand some of the nuances of our art and in order to understand and be able to convey this to people in our culture, I had to have a deeper knowledge than just a surface level knowledge of, um, Uh, of certain aspects. So it helped me to be familiar with the culture. I can speak and quite often I'll be 
I'll be teaching a seminar, and there are times when I'm, I'm called upon to teach a seminar on the history of karate or the history of martial arts and, and things like that in Okinawa. And um, there are people in the room that have been practicing martial arts for 30, 40 years, and they walk out refreshed. They walk out with a completely different understanding because my 46 years wasn't spent in the same zip code. My 40 something years um, allowed me to acquire national, international competitive experience. Um, it allowed me to train with some of the best in the world. And of course, after having done that for a prolonged period of time, my perspective is going to be quite different than other people. Having completed oriental medical training is going to bring something to the table that's a little bit different than perhaps someone that hasn't done that. It's not ever construed to be better. It's just, it's a different perspective because there's, there's a little bit of a uh, foundation and an understanding that's a little bit different. That's all. Mm. That's really all. Okay. So okay. I think um, studying, studying the healing arts for the right type of person can be a natural flow. Um, but it's a totally individual thing. In my particular case, I have no desire to hang out a shingle and um, and see people for the purpose of uh, you know needling or acupuncture or or any of that kind of thing. It's done in conjunction with promoting the understanding of how the body works and the holistic aspect of the martial arts. So as a martial art teacher, it makes me a greater teacher or have a greater capability to be able to reach the students and to be able to help them and help them to understand some of the things that are the foundation that we, we have here. Hmm. I think that's great. And one of the things that I've observed, I certainly have not been training the time that you have, but just in, in my lifetime in my martial arts training, hmm? it seems like there's more interest now in kind of tying those pieces together than there was 10, 20 years ago. And I'm, chalking a lot of that up to the information available on the internet. It's getting people talking, sharing and asking questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I think it's allowed, I think that's a good thing that it's allowed people to have a greater vision than just the local representation of what a thing is. I mean, you know, people can, people can be exposed to the depth and get a glimpse of the depth that they couldn't before. I mean, in, in martial art terms, uh, some things have to be done directly. So for example, I mean, if, and it doesn't matter what aspect we're talking about, there's some things that have to be done directly so you can get that biofeedback, so you can know whether or not you're on the right page. Because a lot of times, you know, especially in the West, we tend to use the Socratic method for instruction and, and learning. And, we, and we, we, we tend to not understand there's a difference in how certain martial arts are practiced and how we've learned some of the other subjects that we've studied, like biology and history and all that kind of thing. So we tend to try to use that same kind of method to the study of martial art, and it doesn't work the result's going to be different. I mean, you can pick up a book and a book can show you the mechanics of kicking, but that's not like learning kicking from Bill Wallace. That's not like studying kicking in situations where you've got the finest practitioners putting it to use and helping you to understand why it's done this way. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I, I think you spelled it out perfectly. Mm. So you've had a lot of experiences. I mean, we've we've dabbled in some of those experiences that you've talked about already. Okay. And most of them have been very positive. I mean, we had that, that initial story, certainly not positive, but it led you to the martial arts. And, mm. you know, maybe we could say that ultimately it was a positive experience. But I'd like you to think now about something on the other end of the spectrum, something nasty, negative, and how your martial arts training helped you overcome that situation? Well, you know, um, 
being active and having a certain activity level over the years has put me in contact with so many people that sometimes I've encountered people that quite honestly, um, it wouldn't matter what, what aspect of life we were in. They're just not people that I would want to interact with. I've, I've dealt with racism in martial arts and, um, in a minor way and in major ways. And those are some of the most hurtful things that somebody can really go through, especially when it's something you love, it's something you're passionate about. It's like, what has race got to do with anything? And you wouldn't think that that would be an issue, but it is for some people. And, you know, um, as cliche as it might sound, the martial arts training that I've received and the depth of the coaching that I've had over the years has been singularly one of the most powerful um, things that has helped me to use things like um, dealing with racism and, and people that have issues. I mean, you know, I don't even know where to start with that either, it, but there've been so many different things that have been said either in as a passing remark or as a global statement that were just, um, they were like personal tests. I mean, do I slap this guy right now? Do I, you know, do I, do I say anything? Is this a situation where I need to say and speak or is this something that, you know, you just prove by your actions whether or not um, what they're what they're getting at is the case. I mean, I've been in situations where I, I've had some people that are highly accomplished martial artists, highly respected by many many people, and I've 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 heard some of the things that some of them have said, whether it was in a personal joking manner, or it was a, it was a statement made out of anger or whatever. And I've heard, I've heard things that, uh, there's really no excuse for, you know what I mean? And it's, yeah. there's certain things that can be a game changer. And for me in dealing with people, those types of things are definitely game changers. Definitely game changers. You know, when you're told, hey, because of the color of your skin, you're not going to be uh, able to do this and this or that and that. You know, that's not something that you would think would find its way into a dojo. Once you come to know what a dojo is all about, you wouldn't think that uh, the opportunity to compete would be linked to that. The opportunity to do anything would be linked to that. But unfortunately, when we don't we we don't have a proper governor, we don't have a proper uh, organization, we don't have um, people that really care about that kind of thing, then that kind of behavior is going to be tolerated. It's not tolerated with me. And I've spent my entire martial art career kind of breaking down misconceptions and, and, and doors of ignorance. And if I had to pick the darkest aspect, racism in the martial arts would be one. That would most definitely be one. I've, uh, I've been approached about writing about that in greater detail because of my experiences in Okinawa and across the country and in other countries as well. But, um, you know, that's one of those things that, uh, I'll, I'll be working on. It's not on the front burner. <laughs> and I hope you do tackle it because it's a subject that has come up on this show 
a few times. Mm. And it's something that, I mean, I'll, let's, let's be blunt. I'm, I'm white. I'm mm. not going to be able to experience that. I don't know what that's like, but it's something that I wish didn't exist. I don't want it to exist. And I know that part of my role is to understand it as much as I can so that if I see it, if I see it building, if I see the hints of it, mm. I can do my best to help address it. Well, see, it, it, you said you said you don't know what that feels like. Um, it's it's something that we can all know what it feels like. It just depends on our choices. For example, if okay. I said, Jeremy, let's go over here to this place. Um, let's go to Japan, and we're going to train for six months with the Japanese national team. And I've done, I've done things like this. And when they see you, you won't have to tell them what color you are. You won't have to tell them anything. They'll know you're not from where they're from. And at times, there's a spirit, there's a nationalistic spirit that comes out sometimes where, where well, we're going to have to show them who we are. And it works on mm. both sides. So a lot of times when you're in an intense environment in Japan, you could be in front of people that their job is to show you that they're no joke. And your job is to show that you're there for the right reason and you're no joke either. And if you can't do that, well, see, that says a lot about what, value the martial art has for you in the first place and what's really the underpinning because when everybody in the room is a black belt everybody in the room is highly skilled and very good then it's the mental game and it's the mental side that takes place that's what separates the top from the other people in the room really okay it's a fascinating subject, absolutely, and it's it's one that I'm glad that you shared. And, and I had a question that you ultimately answered about your experiences here versus in Japan, and it's clear that you experienced some things in both places. Yep. And so, okay. You've talked about – you've named a few names, you know, some people that you had the opportunity to train with, but – you were pretty clear and, and we, we talked about this a little bit before we started recording that not everyone that you've had the opportunity to work out with, let's, let's use that verb. Okay. Would you say I've trained with this person or under this person? Right. So you may have a shorter list to work from than some of our guests uh, just because of that definition. But you told me that there are really only two people that, you would call your, your instructors. At least that that's, was kind of the and impression okay. I got your original. In karate, in karate terms. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've, I've studied many, many different styles of karate, but you only have one first teacher and you have one purpose. In some cases, some of the systems that I came in contact with, like, for example, I'll give you an example. Kyokushin, uh, Kyokushin Kai, uh, karate is a full contact system that doesn't use the same rules for sparring that many of the other, um, Japanese styles of karate use. And it was a personal challenge to study that and to, um, and to learn. And my teacher allowed me to participate because he had a relationship with the the, um, the teacher of that school in New York. And um, there have been other situations like that, but um, I'm just not a believer that, you know, taking a seminar with a person makes you a student of that person. Training with a person a few times makes you a student of that person. That That's, a, that's really low standard. And that leads to misunderstandings. I don't represent anything other than what I've been trained to represent, what I've been trained to do. 
having a casual understanding of some principles. I've been on the floor with thousands of people, thousands of people from many, many different schools. But it's clear who, who, you know, who I study with and um, what the foundation of my, of my practice is. It's, it's very clear. You see, I, I'm just not, um, you know, some people say, oh, I study with Dan and Osanto. I study with uh, Wally J. I study with this one, that one. And, and I've been to places like this, and I've seen this over and over again, where these people are actually in the presence of the people that they say are their teachers, and they don't even recognize them. They don't even know them. Hmm. they were just a face on the mat at that time because they took a seminar. That doesn't make you a student. See, when you have a student, you have a disciple, you have an inner door student, all these are Eastern concepts and they speak for themselves. There's different levels of study being exposed to something. Hey, that's, that's what seminars are for. That's, and it's a great thing now to represent that you're a student of somebody. That's a different thing, isn't it? Yeah. Then to represent that you're the closest student or one of the chosen people in a particular thing, that, well, that's, a, that's an even deeper relationship. But how can you have that relationship if you haven't done the work? Right. If you're not doing the day-to-day thing. And see, martial art wasn't something that was like meant for correspondence kind of work. It wasn't meant for that. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. meant for directly under the hand of a teacher, you know, student, teacher, and the training took place. And there's no substitutes for that. And different teachers may teach slightly different ways and things like that. But in most cases, as you move to the higher levels of skill, and that's what we're talking about, the higher levels of skill, the approaches become more similar. Makes sense. I agree. That's it. So competition, you've, you've alluded to competition that you've spent some time competing nationally and internationally. What is it about competition that you enjoy? Competition as a young person allows you to step outside of your regular environment and test your skills against someone else that has skills. I think the aspect of the mental training of martial art, how to control your emotions, how to control your emotions under pressure. This is what competition is really good for. Okay. Like I said, in the beginning of the show, the emphasis for me in martial art training has always been self-defense has always been survival. So I was never attracted to martial art for show or as they'll say in in Okinawa performance martial art you know you'll see martial art that are developed for the look and then you'll see martial art that is functional I've been more interested in what's functional than in what it looks like you know, and this is not, this is again, not to insult or create any controversy with other groups. It's, if I'm asked my opinion, then this is just, this is just my opinion about it because it is a martial art. And for me, it has to be evaluated on, under a certain criteria. There's many different reasons for studying martial art and there are different things that people get out of it. But for me, it, it's always been important to be able to use it. If you could train with anybody, and I mean, I mean anybody, anybody, they can be dead 50 years. Okay. Who would you want to train under? I would love to have the opportunity to meet and uh, experience some of the people we've talked about. We've talked about Bruce Lee. We've talked about Funakoshi Gichin, we've talked about Miyagi Chojin, and I won't bore the listeners with a list of other names of people that are 
in Okinawa and other places that um, they may not be familiar with, but some of the pioneers to find out their mindset, to see their passion and, um, and to understand more about their struggles in the martial arts as well. And as I've done and conducted my research, which when I talk to people these days, research consists of the internet. And I'm from a generation that you can't research from your living room. You can't do correct research in a convenient sort of fashion and expect the research to give you the same result as if you've not left any stone unturned. For example, there are certain things and people in the martial art that they will never have a web presence. They will never conduct an interview on the internet. They're very inaccessible, except for those that are willing to do more than just punch in a key and hope that something comes up, you see? And that's not how you reach the higher levels of anything. I mean, if you had to have a medical procedure, would you want the practicing physician that's going to do work on you to be the guy that learned it on the internet? (laughs) To be the guy that, you know, he visited, he took a seminar in India once and he's got it now, so he's ready to cut you open. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. For me, there's never been a rush in martial arts about anything. There's never been a rush because it's all based on learning it correctly. And that's always been the focus. Always. Do you watch martial arts movies? Any any favorites? Or are you... I, I, I asked that questioning if you if you even have the time. Right. Of course, that's, that's kind of, of what course. I wonder. <laughs> of course, but I, you know, I, I watch, I watch movies. I watch movies that catch my attention. I don't watch martial arts movies per se, um, unless there's a unless there's a reason for me to watch it. Because I mean, <clears throat> the late seventies and early eighties kind of kind of killed that for me. There, there, there were there were so many bad movies that came out and so many movies that just kind of saturated it that, you know, I I need content in order to make the movie interesting. You know, I I don't need to just see, you know, somebody on the screen kicking and punching things like that. And uh, I've got a vested interest in watching certain types of martial arts movies. So, uh, uh, you know, and I've, I've, um, I've watched some of those movies, but uh, other than that, I, I can't say that I've I've gone out of my way to watch everything that's been presented cinematically. Is my memory failing me, or have you haven't you been in in a couple uh, had some roles? I've made an appearance. I've okay. made an appearance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've made an appearance. But um, what, movie, what movie was that again? Uh, Cops and robbers. Which should be out should be out in the fall. Should be okay. out in the fall of twenty sixteen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cops and robbers. Cool. I'll make sure that we link to to that information. And of course, once it out once it's out, go back and change the show notes for anyone that's new to listening to the show. Sure. Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio dot com is where we keep all that stuff. Yeah, it's real real short appearance, but a lot of fun and. It's a whole different, uh, whole different field, and so much to learn and 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 uh, understand about it. But you know, I was I was uh, I took a good hit in that movie. Let's just say that. <laughs> I look forward to checking that out then. Oh yeah, don't blink too hard because you might miss it. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. Now, how about books? You said you're a reader. I'm guessing that. Books. You've devoured quite a few martial arts books over the years. Yeah, but uh, <clears throat> more more along the line of the philosophy is what's more useful. Um, martial arts books tend to be picture books that yeah. um, 
you know, are, are, are sometimes just more regurgitation of previously done material. Some authors that are out there have not really penned anything unique and done any real scholarly work themselves, um, you know, but rather have rewritten what someone else has already done. But, um, yeah, I have a few, I have a few works that I'm preparing as well. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing some writing and uh, oh, great. on the history and, and, uh, on some other areas, um, doing some translating of some things as well, but I haven't put everything in its cohesive form yet. So I, I've basically just got a desk piled up with all kinds of things as I try to muddle through it because I'm not a writer. So, you know, sometimes I don't even know where to, how to put this stuff together, but I've got people that have, you know, attended my seminars and, and they're very supportive of me doing this kind of work. They feel it would be beneficial. And, uh, you know, so I, I do from time to time do some writing as well. And I look forward to getting, getting something um, completed at some point. If someone was to ask you for a couple book recommendations, you know, maybe on the philosophy, it seems like that's that's the place that you really resonate with the most. Yes. Are there any titles that you would suggest? I would say the first book that I would recommend for anyone that practices karate would be Karate Do My Way of Life by Gichin Funakoshi. That was that was a turning point for me. It was one of the only gifts I ever got from my, uh, my older brother. And I got that at, at, at about 11. I was at age 11. I was always a reader. I always liked it. And the emphasis in that book is on the correct way of both practicing karate and viewing it. And I think that would be an influential book for the right reader. And I think, you know, other books after that, uh, I tend to feel would be more, you know, style oriented and things like that. But that's a book that I think everyone that reads it, if they're in the right frame of mind, um, not distracted, but they can actually enjoy sitting down and reading. I think that's a beneficial book for most people. There are other books as well. Um, Book of Five Rings is uh, uh, by Musashi Miyamoto, one of Japan's most famous samurai, I think is also a uh, a work that uh, martial artists can benefit from, specifically the Japanese and Okinawan martial artists, but anyone can benefit from that. And uh, also Sun Tzu's Art of War. But with those, you know, be careful with the translations that you get of them because they're not all the same. And sometimes a translator that is not familiar with martial strategy or martial art can sometimes not understand the point that's being made in the same way that a, a military strategist or a martial artist would understand. That makes sense. Yeah. So, and certainly three classics, three books that we've talked about on the show that have been mentioned um, and books that if, if people haven't read them, they, they certainly should. So mm-hmm. those are great. I, I I can imagine you at 11. I mean, such, such a young age reading Funakoshi's work um, and, and that. Well, you see, my mom, my mom was a librarian and mm. I grew up. I grew up reading and um and had had a uh, a pretty good reading um what do you call that um evaluation I was several grade levels above where I was required to be at the time so I was a, uh, I was able to read and that's the kind of book that you reread so this is a book that I read for the first time at age 11, I got, I got some menial benefit out of it. Then I reread it as I was a little older. Then I reread it again. And then when I was in Japan, it was such, it was such an awe inspiring feeling to be walking in the streets 
where all of these stories took place and this whole thing unfolded and you know to to, to go behind the scenes and see and, and and be able to talk to some of the family members i mean i i've spoken with um funakoshi gisho who's uh, uh the ancestor of uh of funakoshi gichin and uh had had the chance to talk with him about um practice to practice with him on several kata and to have him look at my karate and give me his opinions and things like that it was just a, a, an awesome experience, just an awesome mm. experience. And, you know, having the, having the platform set by that one book years ago was probably uh, something I'm very grateful for. Yeah, very, I, can, I can only imagine. Yeah. Yeah. What are your goals? Are there martial arts related accomplishments that you're striving for? I think, in terms of, I, I well, think go ahead. my goals, if if I put them simply, would be to just be the best that I can be, and as a teacher, as a practitioner, as a friend, as you know, a father, and every other role that I I'm in, I, I want to be the best that I can be and maximize my potential in those areas. I just, you know, I, I constantly want to improve. And I think that that's my overall goal. And, um, I wake up each day and that's the first thing that I think about. It's an attitude that a lot of our guests have certainly shared mm-hmm. with you. And I, I think it's an attitude that is common among those who have achieved success that, simply to continue to move forward and improve. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's what we're built for. And I think that's what, that's what, if we, uh, if we really think about what makes us happy, I think it's, I don't think it's acquiring things. I think it's working for things. I think it's working towards moving towards things that gives us the greatest gratification you know, I think we get frustrated when we don't feel like we're moving forward, when things don't seem like they're happening. And a lot of times things can happen if we make them happen. Mm-hmm. You know, I think so. But it's all mindset. Right. So now's your opportunity to share with the listeners what you've got going on if someone is in your neck of the woods and interested in, in training. You've mentioned seminars a couple of times. If someone wants to contact you about a seminar or, or anything you, you want to go on, um, think, think of this as your commercial. Oh, okay. Okay. Tell people what's going on. Well, if, if any of the listeners are interested in reaching out or reaching me, they can go to our website, karatehollywood.com. Uh, we, you know, welcome visitors from all styles, that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, I look forward to, uh, interacting with people. You can contact me through that website about seminars and, and that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, I look forward to being on the mat with as many people as possible in the near future. That's it. Great. Any parting advice for the people listening? Well, if I was with our friend Bill Wallace, I'd say keep kicking. But uh, <laughs> I think uh, I think the most helpful advice is is uh, what what I learned from my teacher, which is to not forget what you originally set out to achieve. I think that's the most important advice that I can give because that will create a constant fire. If you remember the feelings that you had in the beginning when you first started after that goal or started on that path, and you can constantly remind yourself of that feeling, that passion, instead of letting it just wane, instead of letting it die out. If you can remind yourself of the intensity that you first developed when you decided to walk through that door and pursue the study of whatever the art is, or when you first decided that you were going to go after this or that, 
I think if you can maintain that, that's, that's going to be one of the keys to success that I've seen the most successful people have. When I consider this interview and the time I've spent with Sheon Campbell, I'm struck by his knowledge and his humility. If you ever have the chance to work with him at a seminar or you're traveling near a school in Florida, Hollywood, Florida, connect with him. I promise you it will be worthwhile. Sheon Campbell, I really appreciate your time in recording this interview. Thank you. Over at Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, you can find the show notes, a place to sign up for the newsletter, as well as other great episodes. You can follow us on social media. Whistlekick is on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram with the incredibly clever nickname, username, Whistlekick. If you want to know what's going on behind the scenes of the show, check out our sort of secret, not really quite, Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. We're always open to new guests for the show, so if you want to throw your hat in the ring, or perhaps your instructor or someone else, head on over to the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, and fill out the form that's there. If you have any feedback, we would love to hear it. Do that on the website, social media, email, whatever works for you. If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing. And you know we're always asking for those reviews because they really help us out. They help us spread the word of the show, push us up in the rankings, which helps new people find us, and that cycle continues. And that makes us happy. If you like what we're doing, this is the best way to help. But you could also buy some stuff. We like that too. Whistlecake.com. Got those great shirts that we talked about at the beginning. Polyester, you know, kind of rash guard shirts under your uniform. Plenty of other great stuff. If you're a school owner or a team coach, don't forget we offer a wholesale program, wholesale.whistlekick.com. And that's all for today. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.